Chapter 24 Up the Main Top Thoughts about Rian's map made me toss and turn in my hammock. Before dawn, I gave up on sleeping and rushed down the hold to tell Bo what I'd learned. But when I opened the hatch and swung my lamp inside, he wasn't there. My feet pounded up the companionway. After everything we had talked about, after all our work together, was he really up top right as the day was about to break? But when I opened the hatch and swung my lamp inside, he wasn't there. On deck, lanterns threw pools of light onto the slick boards. Most of the crew was still below. I pulled my wool cap over my ears and buttoned my cloak against the wind. Bo wasn't in our usual spot on the forecastle. I checked all the narrow crevices between the barrels and boxes of the main deck, but I couldn't find him. Just as I began to climb the quarterdeck stairs, I heard a faint whistle from above. It was hard to see beyond the lantern's reach, but when I looked up, I recognized the shape of Bo's head. He peered down at me over the lip of the main top, the circular lookout platform halfway up the main mast. Triping twit, I muttered. One of the crew jumped down from the quarterdeck steps. I stood aside, pretending to write a note about the weather on an imaginary slip of paper until she had crossed the main deck and gone down the companionway. I could hear other sailors at their stations at the ends of the ship, but the main deck was empty for now. I took hold of the rat lines and started up. I had never climbed the rigging before, but I'd spent hours watching the sailors do it. The trick was to go up steady and know which ropes to hold on to. If you put your weight on an unsecured line, you could go swinging and fall, which I had no intention of doing. I had a stowaway to throttle. The horizon had begun to glow dimly by the time I reached the main top. I used my elbows to drag my belly onto the platform. The waves had kicked up overnight, and this high up the mast, I felt the motion of the ship even more than down on the deck. It was like holding on to the tip of a swinging pendulum. Bo gripped the lines, the wind whipping through his hair. I've got a very good explanation for this. I should throw you into the water, I said. You clearly have a death wish anyway. Bo kept one hand on the mainmast as he edged back from me. Don't be mad. I had to get out of that gousing hold. I've been having awful dreams about being squeezed to death by monsters. And I'm hearing things too. It's all those dragon stories you've been reading. It's all those dragon stories you've been reading. It was still dark, so I thought no one would see. But when I got on deck, I saw someone coming. It was the boy with a scar. I followed Bo around the mast as if we were circling a temple altar. Grebe, do you know what he'd have done if he found you? You'd be jellyfish food right now. I had nowhere else to go, so I came up here. You are a selfish, selfish person, risking both our necks. Behind Bo, the lines leading to the crow's nest tightened and vibrated. I had forgotten someone would be up there on lookout duty. Hide, I whispered. They're coming down. Bo slipped behind the thick main mast. I stood in front of it, hoping that whoever was climbing down wouldn't think to look on the other side. The sailor swiveled off the ropes and landed in front of me. It was dumpling. What are you doing up here, he said, eyeing me warily. Master Payoon gave me permission to come up, I said, to see... If I could spot anything, we should add to our charts. Dumpling leaned in closer to me. The sailor's life had not been kind to him. His eyes were ringed with dark purple circles. His formerly plump cheeks sagged loose on the bone. Has he got you looking out for her? He whispered. What are you talking about? Dumpling's bloodshot eyes widened. For the slake! I pressed back against the mast. Slake? No, of course not. She's been following us for weeks now. She disappeared when we got to Falin, but she's back. She never comes closer than 200 yards, but she's there. Dumpling pushed his scope into my hands. That's where I seen her just now, he said, pointing to the east. Go on, look for yourself. I held the scope and pointed it where Dumpling instructed me. The sun was almost up, and the sea looked vast and bottomless in the lonely morning light. It took me a moment to get the scope in focus. 
I watched the dark waves rising and falling in steady rhythm, flicking white spray off their crests. And then I saw it, the shimmer of something solid. My breath stopped in my throat as a large, dark hump rose out of the water and rolled back down into the coming wave. Another hump, and another followed in line. What in tripe? I whispered. The body disappeared under the surface, and then a sudden stream of water shot straight into the air. I exhaled with relief and lowered the scope. Oh, Dumpling, it's only whales. Dumpling took the scope from me. He looked at me pityingly, as if I were the one talking nonsense. She uses the whales to hide herself. She's a clever beast. Can hold her breath for an hour. I timed it. And when she does come up, she only shows her head. But she knows I'm watching. He pointed two fingers at his eyes and then turned them out at the sea. She looked straight at me. I cleared my throat. Dumpling, have you been eating enough? Maybe I can ask Master Payoon to say something to Dr. Pinching about increasing your rations. No, Dumpling gripped my arm. Don't say anything to anyone. They'll think I'm making up stories and won't let me stay on watch. I have to keep an eye on her, make sure she don't get closer. I didn't want Dumpling to get grounded. He was a good lookout. So what if he saw the slake? At least he was being vigilant. I had something more important to worry about at the moment. Of course, I won't say a thing, I said with a smile, but only if you promise that you'll go down before they call the next watch and get some tea. Dumpling nodded skittishly. His red-rimmed eyes were already trained back on the sea. I waited until he had climbed down and gone below decks before giving Bo the all-clear. That was close, I whispered to him. Dumpling very nearly jumped on top of you. I would have just told him I was a ghost. He'd believe it, no question. He's lost it, that's for sure, I said. But the rest of the crew hasn't. You've got to get below before they ring the next bells. Here, take this. I slipped out of my cloak and handed it to him. And this. I gave him my wool cap as well. Tuck your hair underneath. I helped him button the cloak and stand the collar up to hide his neck. What do you think, he said, holding out his arms. Do I look like a fussy map girl? Just walk fast and keep your head down, I said. If you pass anyone, put your hands over your face like you're throwing up. Bo got on his belly and slid his legs over the edge of the main top. I climbed down onto the shrouds after him, my eyes watering from the wind. Halfway between the main top and the deck, Bo stopped. I nearly put my foot right on his head. Shh! He clung, frozen to the lines. Someone standing right under us. My pulse raced as I looked down, but I relaxed when I realized who stood below. Thank goodness, it's Mr. Lark, I hissed. The man wouldn't notice if an elephant stepped on his toe. Here, let me get around you. Bo shifted over while I carefully climbed past him. Let me handle him. I'll give you a signal when you can come down. I hurried down the shrouds as quick as I could and dropped to the deck. I stood up and called out cheerily, Good morning, Mr. Lark. Oh, sigh, good morning, child. He returned my bow and tucked a notebook into his jacket pocket. Goodness, whatever are you doing up here with no coat? I strolled up to him, swinging my arms. I was roasting down below. They've got the galley fires turned up too high. I circled around him awkwardly until I stood between him and the bulwark, forcing him to turn his back to the mast. Are you working on anything interesting, sir? Lark nodded vigorously and tapped the notebook in his pocket. Something absolutely fascinating, actually. There is a pod of at least twenty fluted whales there, off our port side. Really? I stretched my left arm out and tugged on my earlobe, my sign to bow that the coast was clear. That is indeed fascinating. Lark twirled his long fingers in the whale's direction. It has always been a mystery where the fluted whale spends its summers. Sighting them here, headed south, lends strength to my hypothesis. My hypothesis. Oh, do tell me about it, I said, trying to keep my teeth from chattering. 
Lark looked so great. Lark looked so grateful for someone taking an interest in his research that I thought he might tear up. Behind him, Bo nimbly climbed the rest of the way down and leaped silently to the deck. I believe there is a great surge of nutrients in the southern seas in summertime. Lark swung his arms in big circles, nearly clocking me in the face. This attracts schools of tiny bait fish, which are fed on by larger fish, which in turn are hunted by even larger fish, which are hunted by fluted whales. Precisely. If I am right, we will find the southern waters to be an absolute paradise, full of animals feasting on the bounty that summer brings. I watched Bo disappear into the shadows of the companionway. Finally. I needed to get down below myself before I froze to ice. Will you excuse me, Mr. Lark? I asked with a shiver. I think you're right, and I do need to put on a heaven sigh. Do you see that? Lark clutched my shoulder and pointed up to the sky off the port side. A small flock of ash-colored birds glided high above us, barely even flapping their broad wings. This supports my hypothesis as well, said Lark, bringing out his notebook and scribbling madly in the pages. More species headed at in our same direction. Right. Good day then, sir. I edged around him and started to leave. Perhaps we'll discover where those harbingers nest. Wouldn't that be something? I turned. Harbinger? Is that what the birds are called, sir? Lark nodded without looking up from his notebook. Same name as the sea, they will soon fr- they will soon fly across. The word means omen. Are they an omen of land? Goodness no, said Lark with a chuckle. They can stay on the wing for months without touching down. No one has ever discovered where they nest and raise their chicks. Perhaps we shall. The birds hovered like ghosts just above the crow's nest. Why do they call them harbingers then? They're scavengers, said Lark cheerfully. You see them just before a kill.